But I remember in 2021, we put AI in our product name and all my investors freaked out on me. They're like, no one likes AI. Even though it's, <laughs> it's hard to remember this, right? But like the first right. batch of quote unquote AI companies were really lackluster, really under the covers, totally. if then statements, it really wasn't AI, <laughs> right? But we really had this piece like, no, no, I, th- I think we're going to get there in the next couple of years. And once we do, if we have a really good tool for recording and transcribing meetings, we'll be able to just drop in this AI and the AI will be able to take amazing notes for you. This is a product that people were charging $150 a month for, but we said, we're going to yeah. give it away for free um, because we think that cost curve will catch up. By the time we have enough usage, the cost curve will come down. And we think this thing will just spread like wildfire and then we'll drop in AI when it gets really good and it'll get even better. Fast forward to 2024 and Richard White's vision now is reality. When everyone, including investors, thought AI was a dead end in 2021, he saw what we all see today. Richard is a serial entrepreneur who founded and led User Voice, which provides a better way of understanding and managing user feedback for like 13 years. And in 2020, he founded Fathom and is a customer of his own product as he says, I love talking to customers and prospects, but I hate trying to talk and take notes, trying to edit those notes into something understandable and the disappointment of sharing those notes, realizing they don't convey the same impact that hearing something firsthand does. This is Declan Dunn, and I help entrepreneurs, small businesses, and creatives use AI to their advantage. And I'm honored this week to share part one of my interview with Richard White, founder of Fathom, the number one AI note taker, in episode 61, Better AI Meetings, Fathom Startup Failures and Feedback to Number One. Hey, I love Fathom for its easy use, accuracy, speed, and the way it organizes meeting content, leading an increasingly crowded market. Join us as we look at where the idea for Fathom came from, dealing with failure in a startup, how Richard differentiates Fathom from the many competitors, leading by example and listening to the customer to guide growth of a business. Stay with us later on. Richard shares his AI visions three years from now with the balance of a product developer and the passion of an entrepreneur. And it all began in the lockdown of 2020 when meetings became a way of life for us all. So Richard, really glad to have you. And Let's go back in the way back machine of four years ago in September 2020, when you officially start Fathom, you were running user voice. What did you see in the early days to bring you to AI and notes and meetings? I think right before COVID, I was actually doing a lot of product research, user voice. And so that meant I was on a bunch of Zoom meetings and like I was trying to talk to people and take notes at the same time. And I'm like hurriedly typing up notes. And then after the meeting, I'm like, cleaning up those notes so that they make any sense. And I just felt like this is such a terrible process. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I have hours and hours of great conversations and they boil down into a handful of notes that are really lossy. I don't remember who said what. I'm like getting the quotes not exactly right. And and just a lot gets lost in translation, right? Like humans really react well to like emotion here, like hearing another human say, that's awesome. Or I don't love that. <laughs> and so, so we just had this theory. It's like, gosh, there's gotta be a better way to do this. There were some tools that were doing stuff like this or recording transcription, uh, but they're really focused on salespeople only. And they're really expensive. And we say, gosh, why are they so expensive? Well, because transcription is really expensive. And so we kind of this thesis that like, we think transcription is going to be, become really cheap. And we also think AI is going to get really good, which Seems obvious now, but I remember in 2021, we put AI in our product name and all my investors freaked out on me. They're like, no one likes AI. Even though it's, <laughs> it's hard to remember this, right? But like the first right. batch of quote unquote AI companies were really lackluster, really under the covers, totally. if then statements, it really wasn't AI, <laughs> right? But we really had this piece like, no, no, I, th- I think we're going to get there in the next couple of years. And once we do, if we have a really good tool for recording and transcribing meetings, we'll be able to just drop in this AI and the AI will be able to take amazing notes for you. Um, this is a product that people were charging $150 a month for, but we said, we're going to yeah. give it away for free um, because we think that cost curve will catch up. By the time we have enough usage, the cost curve will come down and we think this thing will just spread like wildfire and then we'll drop in AI when it gets really good and it'll get even better. That was kind of the thesis. That's a hypothesis that came true. Like most startups, Fathom wasn't easy and had its share of bumps and grinds. From 100 monthly active users to 100,000, it's a journey built with calm, competitive focus. Failure is a word you hear often from startups, since the majority of them fail. 
Now I ask Richard what failure meant to him and how he navigates this with Fathom and his team. It's really funny. And I can imagine like having been in way different times, but a different sort of startup where things that we thought would work weren't working, this feeling of failure. And I think failure is probably, in my opinion, the most overused phrase by entrepreneurs, which is totally self-directed because as I say, People don't generally look at others and say, oh, you're a failure. And if they do, it's probably pretty toxic. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a, but it's a common thing. And so with your team and growing this, how do you frame, obviously, the expectation and what you get? I don't want to say how do you frame failure in a sense is, is a sloppy way of saying it, but you're obviously, you're a product developer, you're iterating. How do you get your people through the time and to keep like, focused and going forward and not letting that negative feeling of like it's not working which when it does i always say be amazed how do you get them through those tough times of development all the startups i've worked on were solving a problem that i had and yeah. so i think I, I think sometimes i see founders that are that delude themselves about their products right where it's like they wouldn't sure. use it for someone else's product but because it's their own they'll ignore all the warts and they'll use it but i think if you can stay relatively sober about your assessment of how good your product is, and it is truly transformational for you, I, I think that just gives a really good bedrock of like, even in these moments, I wasn't ever, I don't think I ever expressed existential dread because I like, I've seen it work for, for myself. I saw it work for my team. I saw it work for the sample right. beta users. So I knew there's something there. Maybe we're wrong about the TAM. Maybe the market is as big as we thought. Like that, that's all often possible. Like you build a product for yourselves and through that there's only... 800 people in the world like you that have this problem, right? Like, okay, that's probably a more right. common sin. But in this case, it was like, no, I, I, I didn't really ever give up on it because I knew the impact it was having on my work life. And so we just had, to, that's why I was like, there has to be more to this story. And that's why we kept digging until we found out, oh, okay, here's here's what the problem is. It's not, it's not us, it's them. <laughs> like it, it's, a, it's the user <laughs> we're getting sort of thing. So yeah. Sure. So, but I do think it's important as a founder, like, not lose hope like because your team looks to you for that kind of stuff right and i think right. again the way i don't lose hope is just by making sure i'm grounded in i i believe in this product right and i can see what it's doing and i'm not deluding myself about it totally totally and it's you know it's funny is it's so important especially as founders that leading by example because some people tend to be very charismatic um which is fine everybody has their style but leading by example is so underrated because if you're, I've seen founders who are just the stress and the anxiety and totally cool, just reflects and, the, right. and everybody looking at them's like, hey, you better jump ship. Right. As you can see by Fathom's rise as a leader in AI note taking, few if any jump ship. Richard has a quote from his friend Justin Kahn. First-time founders obsess on product, second-time founders obsess on distribution, and that brings a steadying force to the turbulence of AI business. Startups and early businesses love to say that they A-B test, but if you know testing, you know they don't have enough volume to do real testing. It's a bluff. Learn how to navigate from your gut, from intuition and experience, as Richard shares learning from his customers to find out what's most important to fathom for them. In a lot of B2B products, you don't get the scale to be able to do things in a data-driven way, truly, right? Like a lot of stuff is is guess and test because your TAM's not big. You you got a couple hundred users. Um, but with Fathom, we can, you know, we're a B2B product, right? But we have enough scale because it's kind of a prosumer product too that, like I said, we had 100,000 users. That's an, more than enough to run A-B tests, more than enough to do, you know, you can change some of the onboarding funnel and it only takes you a couple of days to see statistical significance. I like to think about metrics and I is I like to think about metrics back to front. So I, th I always say, I want to solve mm -hmm. one key metric at a time in the business. I see a lot of people that like start nice. off and they're like, we're trying to monetize and we're trying to prove engagement and we're trying to fix our onboarding. I'm like, pick one, right? And in Fathom's case, it was like, we, we've, I've always start with free user retention first. I'm a big mm. fan of monetize. We didn't monetize for until we were two years in. Um, I'm a oh, big wow. fan of delayed monetization because I think it's hard enough to get people to use the thing, but then to get them also to pay for it, getting them to use it's a hard enough barrier for most products, in my opinion. And I'm generally a, yeah. of, of the belief that if someone's using your product day in, day out, you'll eventually find a way to charge them or you'll charge people like them. 
Um, so right. we focus on retention first and really figured out retention. Once we figure out retention in that beta period with those 50 users I mentioned, then great, we launched, we saw those users, we saw that onboarding didn't work. And then we got really smart about, okay, let's make sure onboarding works really well. Great. Now that onboarding works really well, let's focus on referral loops and like virality. Mm. Oh wait, the market shifted. No one cares about growth. Put referral loops on the shelf and go focus on monetization. And so I think in all these cases, we then, there's a top level metric and we go build a dashboard of here's all the things that contribute into that metric. And every day, I think on the onboarding thing, I paired with one of our engineers and we spent three mm -hmm. months and every day we were just like, okay, let's look at the numbers today. What feels like the weakest spot we could push on? Ah, oh, let's go get rid of that page. Let's go simplify this page. And I just, there was a, there was like a, you know, PRD probably notion page, like about five pages long at the end of it. Just here's all the bullet points of things we did every day. And so, and then yeah. check the numbers. So I think that approach to kind of like data driven things, again, you not most, many, most startups can't do it at an early stage, which is why you've got to go with your gut. But if you have enough data, obviously it's a <laughs> the way better way to operate sort of thing than trust and verify. No, totally. And data driven is, uh, we all want to be data driven, but especially in a startup level, knowing you don't have the scale, knowing you don't have the numbers, I really encourage a lot of them to, to, to what you're doing you, and to practice you do, which is really reach out. Even if you got a little group of people, start talking to them, listen, 10 people will change. And if somebody hates your product, I used to actually call them and Dude. say, I'm sorry you hated our product. And in a good way, like I'm not selling yeah. you. Yeah. What did what did we miss? Because that person who doesn't like you, you missed one thing. That's usually like, oh man, <laughs> like that wasn't the thing I thought was important. I think one of the benefits you mentioned user voice, my last company where I spent twelve years as a platform for product feedback. So I spent twelve years trying to figure out how to get better feedback from people. And the biggest thing I came away from is like you should not be afraid of passionate feedback, even negative. You should be afraid of apathy. So right. you should be afraid when you send an email, how, what do you think of my product? And no one responds. No one cares either way. When people are mad, they're usually mad because your reality doesn't meet their expectation and they were excited about their expectation. And usually to your point, it's like you just got to flip one or two bits and now they're, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I wanted, right? So, I, but I think that's hard. I actually think the dirty old secret of feedback is everyone says they want feedback. No one actually deep down wants feedback, right? Like, because... If you go up and get feedback on your product, you already like your product. It's your baby. What are you going to, what are you going to hear? Like, you're probably not going to hear it's amazing. You're probably going to hear it sucks. And right. I don't know if I want, like at this like core emotional human level, that's a hard thing to hear on something you're working hard on. So I think there's a lot of us in Foundryland that delude ourselves and be like, oh, like I cherry picked some people and I got their feedback and we're doing great. Right, like <laughs> <laughs> my little like echo chamber, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Because I'm, yeah, it's the same reason that these big companies you hire the consultant to tell you what you already the to you know validate decision you already wanted to make, right? You're like I always want to build this feature, so I'm going to go get some feedback that validates that we should build this feature, right? Like <laughs> that's like that happens so often. Oh, and it's the irony that if no one hates you, you haven't reached enough people, right? Right. Statistically, if you get no returns or no churn, again, just haven't reached enough people or you're narrowing your ICP, which is interesting because your space has so many different companies doing different iterations of like sales and some just doing transcriptions. How do you like initially position Fathom to stand out and, you know, differentiate yourself? Is it technology, user experience, specific features? What, what's, cause I love the way you really focus on specific items. How did you sort of go through that process to, to stand out in what seems like everyone's doing the same thing, which is totally not true. Well, this is, I mean, going back to my hypothesis around, again, we thought AI was going to be good and we thought transcription is going to be cheap. But da, da, da. Part of that was like, if you wait till those two things are true, it'll be very, it'll be way too late. Right. And so we kind of yeah. said like, because I think we're in this era now where all these en engineers have decided like it's kind of the new oh i can take a transcript and put it in gp4 and do interesting things like it's the new hello world for every <laughs> every startup engineer out there sort of thing <laughs> wait, um, wait. my friend justin Kahn has this great tweet that i love it says first time founders think about products second time founders think about distribution and mm. what we kind of um. said was like look 
I think we can make the best AI summaries. And, and I think objectively, when people look at our like the quality of our output versus others, we come out ahead. But I think the real thing we've done is we got out well ahead of the market. We said yeah. well before AI was even any good, we were here building out the video infrastructure, the recording infrastructure, the transcription infrastructure, and dialing in the user experience of the onboarding process, whatnot. And we built out all our, all our own infrastructure. And so we can give away more in our free product than anyone else can because we have probably the lowest cost basis in the market. And we've had the most time in the market, so we've had the most time to perfect the user experience. So I always like to lead with quality. Like I don't think people will pick a low quality product because it's free. We objectively think that we have the best note taking bot. It'll take it's the most reliable. It gives you the most accurate notes, but it also is the one all your friends are using. It's also the one that's you know been out in the market the longest, has the most G two reviews, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, yeah. I think it's one of the things like we just make it a no brainer. Why would you choose anything else? This is the number one rated thing. It's the most robust free version, and people that like like everyone's got that one friend who tries to tries out all the tools and tells you which one's good. All that that friend's going to choose Fathom, right, on the quality aspect. So that's kind of how we differentiate. I think it's so. I think it's all of the above, right? I think you have to compete on every axis to win in, in this day and age. I found Fathom through my friend like that, who looks into software with a keen eye and experience, and his recommendation will get me trying a tool. That's word of mouth most talk about, and you have to earn it. But how many of you like to get feedback on your business? Not many. In fact, Richard shares how common it is for founders to simply look for consultants and echo chambers who praise what they do because listening to real feedback is hard. It's emotional. And it's the core of what separates a successful venture from one stuck in the fear of feedback. And in the new market of AI, speed is a feature and you get fast by listening to your team and listening to your customers. That's the feedback loop that drives growth. It's interesting, the speed factor now, that I'm sure in the early days, it, I don't say it's impossible, but it must have been brutal. But the wow factor I get from people who are totally too busy to even understand this, I'll get them on a meeting, and then 30 seconds after the meeting, they got a note. And again, it reflects on me looking like I'm a genius. <laughs> but that speed implies genius. How did you like, how did y'all work getting that, the speed up? I mean, the speed level of being able to respond and respond right. accurately. It's funny you mention because it's like speed, I think Google says this, right? Speed is a feature. And I remember because when we were four years ago building the first prototypes and testing other products, like even Zoom takes half an hour to get you the recording. Gong would take you, take half an hour to get you the recording. And I remember saying to the team, it's like, if I'm trying to replace note taking, one of the things notes have is immediacy. I don't want to i can't replace note taking it's going to take me half an hour and i remember telling the team it needs to be faster like we need to get you this as close to when the meeting ends as possible i remember the engineering team being like how fast does it need to be and i was like i don't know just keep making it faster and i'll tell you when it's fast enough and i remember it was, they guess 30 minutes and then we got down to 10 minutes and then we keep going five so. minutes two minutes and eventually we got down to about 30 seconds so i was like okay cool now it's i'm like this is fast enough right like i don't need it within three seconds of the meeting ending. But if you get me through the first 30 seconds, I can do all my post-meeting work. I can set out my notes. So I can, great. I feel like I can put that meeting to bed sort of thing. And still to this day, I think we're also still a lot of our competitors take five, 10, 15, 30 minutes to, to get you those notes, right? And like, it seems like a small thing, but I think it's one of the key features, right? Speed is probably one of our biggest features. Not totally. And it's so funny because if you did it like in three seconds, maybe it's possible, but there would be a weird believability factor right. that might play yeah. into it. Right? Yeah. Like, wait, this is yeah. too quick. You got to think. Yeah. Even AI has to think. Yeah. But you're like, um, one of the things I find fascinating and I really liked about Fathom was the fact that you can actually take these templates. Because if I'm doing a, I do B2B. So if I'm doing a sales call, I love to iterate and do stuff on myself. If I'm doing meetings, and they're sort of team meetings. That's a different sort of uh, team sort of approach. And I do things like analyze who's talking most. I do this with CEOs all the time. I'll analyze their meeting and say, you're giving a lecture. Stop. You know, breaks through advice. But where did you come up with the idea to templatize that? Because most people just say one meeting is one meeting. And you have these different templates that I think is just really a, a key strength, at least from my point of view. 
Yeah, we've got 15 different templates now, you know, a couple of different, depending, a couple of different sales ones, depending upon what your sales methodology is, one-on-one templates, retrospectives, you name it. And we also just added the ability where you can give the AI feedback and be like, I want the sales template, but I also want you to make these adjustments to it sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I actually originally thought that, no, you can have kind of one notes to rule them all sort of thing. But as we got into yeah. it, we realized like the best notes are the ones that are exactly the way you want it, right? And I think everyone's got years and years of experience writing notes and we know exactly what we want. And so if the AI just gives you something generic for all your meetings, it's like, man, eh, that's not replacing note taking, right? If it doesn't match the output right. I'm trying to get. And so we actually think that that's an important differentiator is being able to have not just really good notes, but really good notes in the format that makes sense for you and your business. And we're actually going to be doing a lot more on this where you're going to get fully custom, you know, Ability to like fully customize templates, right? Not just give it feedback. Because uh, we think it's yeah. really important. We think that's like a, it, it it makes you look like a genius, right? When your boss is like, oh, I need those notes. And you're like, oh yeah. And it's in our weird, whatever corporate format we use for these meetings, right? Like, oh, we've got our special Amazon style, memo style, right? Right. The AI is really good now at writing these things and it can really adapt to all these things. So yeah, I think we'll, I think like figure out how to make Fathom kind of customizable. I think all the best products, I think about Slack back in the day, one of the things great yeah. about Slack, you, people start building these bots for it and like they're able to extend it and really just make it their own. And I, I think we just launched a Zapier integration a couple months ago. We've seen what people have done with that. And so mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of appetite. I think, I kind of think AI is going to do to the operational side of businesses what open source did to product development. Meaning wow. you can now build automations that have judgment, right? Which is always yeah. the challenge. Like, Historically, judgment was only the purview of the humans, which is why you have a 10 person engineering team, but a hundred person sales team. Now right. you can basically build automations judgment. And what you need to be able to build those automations is access to data. And honestly, one of the biggest data sets in your business is what's being said in your meetings. So we're really excited about building out a lot more ways for people to use the information coming out of your meetings from the Fathom structuring for you to build a bunch of automations and better no customizations. AI is going to do to the operational side of business what open source did to development. Let me write that down. He's talking about building automations that have judgment. What Hypemeisters call AI agents, this is real and happening. And now it's time to reveal Richard's vision for the AI future, if that's the right word, for the next three years. He's humble in the face of changing AI and how dynamic it is. And his approach symbolizes the new entrepreneurs who design businesses like product with focus and passion and customer-centric approaches. He didn't start Fathom to sell technology. He creates and iterates it to solve problems real customers have. And he's one of them and adapts with them. Powerful. Take a listen. Last question is, and we sort of touched a little bit on this, but, you know, I use meetings to actually do a lot of coaching and consulting with people to be able to tell them things like I do sentimentality analysis, personalization. And these are things I can do by hand, and certainly it's more of a service. But imagine yourself now, like five years from now, or in 2029, you're looking back at 2024. How does Fathom, you said a little bit about this, plan to evolve its product to stay competitive and what sort of, you know, even on a dream level, what unique features will define its future in, in AI and in general and people being able to be comfortable in using this kind of AI tool? I'm not even sure I can see the 2029 version because this stuff is happening so fast, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think we nailed the we nailed the transcription cost thing. Like, we cut, it, it happened right we thought. But the AI stuff has actually happened way faster than I would have thought. Um, I'll yeah. give you the 2027 version, maybe, or cool. 2028. Cool. I'm excited about this world. If you think about the modern working world, the ratio of like real work to busy work, right? The amount of time where it's like, oh, I have this meeting, I track these action items, I log this thing here, I move this thing from this from my knowledge base to my task tracker. Like, there's all this kind of like bit shuffling, right? To to keep the humans organized. And I think what yeah. we're really excited about is a world where you can just it really does feel like an assistant, right? Before I get on a meeting, this reminds me of why I'm getting on this meeting. Here's here's the last one you had. Here's like, you, here's what you're trying to cover. And just when you're on these meetings, when you're talking to other people, whether it's in person or remotely, just speaking something 
brings it into existence. And that's what we're starting to see now. It's like, I just mentioned it actually, I am all of a sudden in my HubSpot. Pretty soon it'll be in my HubSpot and it'll actually get done by the AI agent. So it's like, we'll, yeah. we'll really be unlocked to just be kind of our full creative selves. And we're here to do the things the AI can't do, which is imagine up like the solutions to some of these problems. And when it gets down to the tactical things of do this stuff, oh, like before, before the meeting even ends, tasks have been created, the tasks have been completed. Oh, you know, like it's going to feel really magical like you're wearing an Iron Man suit sort of thing. And I think the other Thanks. half of that is on like a team level, the amount of time we spend in meetings to try to understand what's happening in other teams or figure out what our customers saying. And like all of this information is, doesn't flow very well in the organization, right? Like how many engineers have a good picture of what customers are struggling with and, and not just read some bullet points, but actually can hear it in their own voice. And so I think we're in this world where one part is when you're in the meeting, you speak into existence, but if you're not in the meeting, doesn't mean you're not aware of the parts, right? Like we talk, start talking about Tim in a meeting. We can also say, Hey, send him this passage. I think he'll be interested, right? Great. Now Tim doesn't yeah. have to go to like five hours of meetings this week. He just gets ordered when those things come up. Right. And so it's going to be this really cool way where we'll have kind of this, like, again, kind of like a Iron Man esque Jarvis kind of system that's backing us up. Mm feeding us all the data we need to to be informed and make really smart decisions. I, it's going to be wild. I, I think the, the yeah. amount of stuff we can even do, we have a whole team that all they do is figure out what is that now, the frontier of AI and like what can we put into the product. And there are things we couldn't do six months ago that we've been wanting to do for a while that we can now do. Uh, and there's things where it's like, like six months from now, we'll be able to do 10x of what we can do today. So it's... Wow. It really is, I think, a wave unlike anything we've seen in a while since maybe the late nineties. I I totally agree, and and the thing I love about your approach is that I've personally I've um, against the AI industry. It's one of the old things where they're here's the technology, and they throw it at a company and say, "Company, where do you fit in the technology?" Where that to me is backwards because when you start with the meeting, mm -hmm. it's almost like an intelligent object. The meeting now becomes intelligent and can communicate with you based on usage and stuff. And then it's so much easier for, okay, now we solve this. Now we can go here. Now we can go the next one. And I think the AI industry, I don't want to be all preachy, but I think that's what's happening is getting down to those unique tasks that they can solve. It's, we, we have a style we have on our, on our AI team. I, I call it like Jenga style R and D where I kind of <laughs> think about Jenga block. Each block is like a use case and a model. And we always say, if we push on a block and we get resistance, stop, because we mm. want to find it where it's easy. Because you can bend AI to your will and make it do things that are maybe a little bit ahead of its capabilities today. But then you'll find yeah. you spend three months to build a thing and three months later, it was a you know, one line change and now it works seamlessly, right? So it's really mm. fun kind of, I've been doing software for almost 20 years. This is the first yeah. time it feels like real R&D now. It's not just we're building for a long time, we we're just building front interfaces that look pretty in their workflows. Now it feels like we're really like, does this work? Does this work? Oh, this works. Great. Ship it. Right. Sort of thing. It feels like a real R&D yeah. app. Cool. Cool. Well, listen, um, thanks so much for joining me. I really enjoyed this. And uh, for folks, I have links to Fathom. Um, definitely try it out. And if anything, make your meetings more efficient <laughs> and stop wasting time, which is actually, I think, the beauty of these tools have put that PayPal idea originally, why do we have meetings into something tangible and making meetings more efficient, which is what you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. If anyone wants to reach out to me, if you have any questions, you can find me on LinkedIn. So for Richard White at Fathom on LinkedIn, happy to chat.